so before I start, I just want to thank everybody for being here. I know you probably much rather play Overwatch 2 now, but, you know. Anyway, so I'm Thomas Tageson. I work, or I don't work as a hard surface artist, but I am a hard surface artist. Um, and I'm going to go through some, some different workflows that I do. This is just one of probably a hundred ways of doing the same thing. But yeah, so a little bit about me. I used to work uh, for a very tiny company in my beginning here uh, called Edvit, where I basically modeled machines that sprayed concrete in tunnels for a simulator. And then I went on to join the school, the Game Assembly, which is here in Sweden. It's a game art school that focuses on game art, uh, game programming, animation, tech art, and all that stuff. It's a really good school. And when I finished that, I got an internship at Ghost, or EA, where I worked on Need for Speed Heat. And then I got hired after my internship uh, and shipped Need for Speed Heat, which was pretty cool. Um, sadly, that studio got closed down, so then I moved on to Pieces Interactive, where I am now as an external art lead. And external art lead is basically someone who works with spreadsheets and goes to meetings all day. Uh, and there we're currently working on Alone in the Dark. So my journey has been a little weird, probably as anybody else's journey. Uh, I started focusing on characters because I thought it was so cool to be able to make like cool knights and sci-fi stuff and all of that stuff. Um, but then I realized how hard it is and how much it sucks to do that. So I decided to switch to environments, um, which is also very difficult. And uh, people who do that are very cool. So I landed on props, vehicles, and weapons, which is, of course, not that easy either, but to me, it felt the most right. And I think for all of you students, this is an important lesson in learning that you need to specialize on things. And you can also start off out wherever you want and find what you like to do, of course, but then specialize is very important. Anyway. So my main programs that I use uh, for my high polys is Maya or Fusion 360 and ZBrush. Um, it's mostly Boolean workflows in ZBrush. I'll show you what I mean with that as we go on. And then for low polys, I use Quadra in Maya. You can also use Topogun or Blender or whatever. It, it doesn't really matter as long as you feel comfortable in it. You get the same result no matter what. For baking, I tend to use Marvel's a tool bag the most because it has baking groups, which is fantastic. So you can mitigate the errors you get from cages and all that stuff that's bad. But if it's a very simple model, then Substance Painter is absolutely fine to bake in. And I'm sure you can use Blender to bake as well. I, I haven't really used it, so I can't vouch for that, but yeah. Texturing Substance Painter, as everybody else, it's a great program. I used to texture in Photoshop back in the day, and also have used Quixel's texturing suite when that existed. Uh, Substance Painter is miles ahead of that, thankfully, and makes everything very easy. And then for presentation, I usually use Marmos at Toolbag for everything, but I'm trying to get more into Unreal, especially 5, because it is very powerful with what you can do with shaders and everything to make your art come alive a bit more than just a static image in a gray background. All right, so the workflows I'm going to go through with you today is sub-D or subdivision modeling, uh, which I use Maya for, as I said, but any modeling software can do it. There's really no, I don't think there's any that can't of the standard ones. And then the Boolean workflow, I use ZBrush, 
but I think Blender can do it very well as well. And I think 3D aspects can do it. I'm not entirely sure, but don't use Maya for it. It's terrible and breaks a lot. So yeah. And then for the last workflow I use sometimes, depending on how complex the mesh is, is Fusion 360 and CAD. And that is free for educational use for anyone. So I recommend you download it if you are interested in that. All right, let's get into what we're making. So my idea came from watching a Adam Savage One Day Builds, uh, which you should all watch that if you're interested in hard surface or prop creation or anything, because it's so cool. And the reason I chose that is because the thoughts and the workflows are basically the same as in 3D uh, with the Boolean workflow that I'm going to show you. So here you can see he's put a cylinder on a lathe where he cuts out the shapes instead of putting together a bunch of pieces. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So the main shape we're going to look at, or the main model we're going to look at, is this lightsaber that he also created. And what's very important when you're looking at props is to identify the most basic shape that it is. People tend to overcomplicate because it looks very daunting. This one is fairly simple, but generally when it comes to props, it's much easier than you think it is. So we start with a cylinder. We look at the silhouette and we make sure that we know how that looks. The, the good thing about 3D is that we can extrude stuff, right? And we don't have to worry about cutting every single shape out. We can model the basic stuff. Uh, I'm going to also show you this in Maya, but I thought I would go through it first. So you kind of have a grip of what we're doing. And then finding actual measurements, super important, because this will help a lot when you're working in the industry, for example. Everything is, needs to be to scale. Oh yeah, and I'm gonna go through realism. Stylized is not something I delved into and that can differ from this. I don't have any experience, so I'm not gonna pretend I do. But then we can trace the silhouette with curves in Maya. This is one of the workflows that you can use that I use sometimes, not that often. And then you would revolve that curve along the, the axis, which makes it into the shape of the sil uh, silhouette. Or you could do the normal thing, which is extrude a cylinder along the silhouette, and you get the same shapes. Now, here comes the sub-D part. We want to be able to subdivide this to make it high enough to accept the booleans so it looks good. So what we need to do is select every supporting edge uh, and then bevel those. Supporting edges would be uh, the most important edges for the shape to, to hold it. And if you need to do sculpting, you need to add extra edges in between so you get a fairly even topology. Otherwise, you'll probably end up with a 20 million mesh that could have been only 2 million, for example. Now we get into the Boolean workflow here a bit more. We need to identify what are the cuts, right? And that would be mainly this shape here and these little indents here, for example. And when we've done that, we also get all the reference we need so we make sure that, okay, we can see all the angles and we know where the little screws are, the little indents here, for example. This is um, a replica, which is a fantastic reference because there's very high risk pictures of it. So, all right. So we go into Maya or Blender or whatever modeling work, modeling package of your choice. Uh, the workflow one that I talked about is this curve. I need to fix this so it's not that bright. This curve, right? So the way you can create that is via curve tools, CV curve tool. 
and here this d defines if you want a sharp curve or for example let's see here a smooth curve but in this case we want a sharp curve because that's very useful for this so we start with snapping it to the grid here to make sure that okay it's in the center because that matters for revolving stuff and then we just follow the shape super simple just trace it once we've done that we can take this curve and we can go to surfaces and revolve now this is black as you see and that's because the normals are reversed uh, which is not an issue we can reverse them very very simple so that is one way to get the shape that we need or we could go into just extruding a cylinder so this is just an extruded cylinder i'll show you that as well even though you probably are very well aware of how to do this just as usual scale it size oh yeah i forgot to mention that it is very important right to get your scale correct in maya there is a tool called measure tools and distance tool where you can use just snap out here and it'll show you the unit in what your scene is set in and for my scene it's set to centimeters so i know this is 29 centimeters but yeah uh, extruding you probably know all know how to do that it's super simple you need to turn off symmetry you scale right and do your thing as usual it's simple stuff when you've done that you have added a supporting edge right uh, this is all the little supporting edges to make sure it keeps the shape if you don't have them then we will basically end up with a smoothed mesh that looks like this and that looks more like a candlestick than this shape which we don't want at all but yeah so we have the main shape right now we need to figure out the cuts that we're gonna do basically so we have these little indents i guess we can call them uh, what I did first was to basically, let's see here, I think it's, no, it's not that one. It is, should have been a little bit more prepared there. There, sleeve, uh, silhouette cuts. So what I did was just to make it very visual, I just made a cube to show how simple it can be. But essentially what we want is a cylinder right again once again every every single thing is basically built from cubes and cylinders so that's what we're going to work with so what i do then is just go into my side view here and make sure it is the right size i'll just add in a center line here so we can Extrude that in. These are a little bit too big, of course. I need to scale them down, which I should have done from the beginning. And that's essentially the shape we wanted there, except that we need it to be duplicated everywhere. Um, let me just do this quickly so we don't need that right now. Uh, but when we've done that, we end up with all the cuts we need which are very very simple stuff it's it's basically this shape that is duplicated and then just caged in or what you should say like uh, a, a solid mesh and this is because zbrush does not like when you have non-solid meshes so for example if we have this cube and you delete that face, it's not a solid mesh anymore. And when you smooth this in ZBrush, this will shrink and that can mess up what we want to do. And it's the same here. It's just simple cubes made to the shape we want. 
and add the supporting edges around so we can smooth them. And when we have that, we go into ZBrush for the Boolean workflow. It's the same meshes, it's the main shape and all of these things, right? This is a little thing that I added because I forgot to model it. Um, and when we're done that, have all the shapes in here, we press this little circle here to cut away or this to add it. And then we press live boolean and we get the shapes that we need. Super simple. You, you Anybody can do this. It's very simple workflows. It's literally cylinders and cubes. When we've done that, we make it into a boolean mesh, of course. And you can do this with several different pieces. I have, for example, the sleeve here. It's just a cube and a cylinder. It's the same workflow. And uh, then I added in some cuts here on the side with just a rounder cube and the cylinder again. Get a bit more of an interesting shape. Oh yeah, if anybody has questions during this, just feel free to ask it either in the chat or just interrupt me in voice. Uh, but yeah, so when we've done that, all of these simple cuts and stuff, right? We need to, once again, make sure you have reference, look at what you need. Super simple cylinders. Once again, cylinder, that's a little cut here. And uh, yeah, you can also add in stuff like this little thing if you want it indented in the mesh. But once we've done that, we basically get something like this. So once again, the important thing to remember with hard surface and props like this is that split it down to its most simple part, right? These are just two cubes that I put together in ZBrush with the same workflow as we looked at. And this is just cubes, again, that's cut out of it. A little triangle, same here, cylinders. And yeah, this is also just a cube cut with a cylinder, added onto a cylinder, and then uh, the little bits we have here. And that's essentially the workflow for all the things I do. It's not a lot more than that. But what you can end up with, with the same workflow, is more complex things like this. It might look daunting, but once again, simple cylinder. We have identified the shapes of it. That is just a simple, simple cylinder. Then we've added cubes or cylinders around it to cut out these little teeth. We have uh, done this thing that's actually three separate parts. It's just three cylinders stacked on top of each other. But this cylinder is uh, complete. These ones I cut out with essentially, let me show quickly here. What I did was just take a cube. Once again, super simple, keep it simple. And just get the shape from the reference that I can see. So basically I cut out each of these cylinders separately with just that. And then added that on. These little things were modeled and just attached to it. These are just cubes once again. And then adding holes like this is not supposed to look like this, of course. Um, that was a little error I did, so don't mind that. Same again here, cubes. That's slightly modeled after this. And then cube once again to cut this out. And then a cylinder to cut the, the hole out. That's really the, the workflow that I do. It's not much more than that. Same goes for this shape here. Just trace it with the plane, extrude it, and then put it into ZBrush and cut it again. So it's, it's really that simple.
And the last part that I use sometimes, I am not fully proficient in this yet, but it's fusion. It looks very strange and very not artist friendly, but it really, really is. The difference in here is that you don't have to worry about any topology whatsoever, because it's CAD, essentially, so it doesn't care about that. But it's also a different workflow overall, where you basically sketch in 2D first, so we can sketch a little circle here, for example. Extrude that. So we get it out like this. And in Fusion, this is called a body. Uh, I don't know why it's called a body, but that's basically what it is. And let's say we want to add uh, some more interesting shapes to it. Now I'm probably not going to make anything interesting, but uh, we can just add a little thing here. Once again, just a sketch uh, in the 2D plane. And then we can take that and uh, extrude it once again. And then we will automatically set it to cut because it goes into the other mesh. But you can change it here to either join or make it a new body if you want to modify that before you do anything. So we'll make it a new body just for this sake. And then we can search for a command called mirror. Select the body of itself and select this axis to make it symmetrical. And uh, we can do a pattern on a circle. So we select the object and we select the axis, which we want this one to be right, right now. And then we can add as many as we want, for example. But we probably want to just play with this shape a little bit first. I'm not great with the controls right now because I switch between a lot of stuff. Uh, so you can, for example, fillet it as it's called in Fusion, which is basically a bevel. You can also make something called a chamfer, which is just a split of the edges. So it's also technically a bevel, but uh, it's different names for different softwares all the time. But that's, that's the main two ones that are quite good to know. Let's say we wanna just use this as our cut then, for example. So what you do in Fusion is called combine instead of just cut. Because you can join meshes, cut meshes, and intersect meshes. So we select that one and cut it. And then we get the shape instantly. Then you can also always clean up to make it easier to work with, because Fusion is an Autodesk product, so it can be a bit temperamental. And let's say we want to fillet these edges just to make it a bit softer. You can do then uh, this one, for example. Like this would probably take a little longer to sub D model. So having something like Fusion is fantastic for this. It makes stuff so much simpler. You can also just offset this circle if you want a hole in here of the same shape. And then just extrude that in, for example. You got a little moon. Um so I can show you some stuff that I've done with Fusion that are a little bit more interesting to look at. But for weapons especially, it is fantastic. And all of this also you started with getting a proper scale, getting all of that done, and then cylinders, cubes, spheres. And that you can do, no problem. Should I answer the questions now, or should I wait to the later, Paul? What do you think? Uh, we can we wait till the end. Now. Yeah, we can wait okay. till the end. Yeah, okay. Uh, we can look at some other stuff as well. 
one thing to note when you're doing weapons specifically is to work from basically making the bullet first to make sure you have the right scale. Because there's always, always sizes on bullets on Wikipedia, for example. And if you get that correct, you can then build the barrel and the magazine, which will also be correct because you have the bullet scale, and then from there build the body around the gun. But essentially, these are several different parts slapped together to make a gun. They're all just cubes and cylinders, again. It might look very daunting here because it is fairly complex, I guess, but it, it really isn't when you, when you start. Like, that's something I learned while learning hard surface, I guess. It's just break it down into its simplest form first before you do anything. Don't try to model, let's say, this shape instantly with everything attached. Look at it, separate it as much as you can. So we have a cube at the bottom with a cylinder on top. You can mash those together and you got the main shape of it, essentially. And then add another cylinder for the lens. And then you can cut out these shapes eventually as you go. Like it's, it's important to really, really think as simple as you can. And uh, I think I talked a lot too fast because I don't really have much more to say. <laughs> Unless there is any specific things you want me to go through, Paul, more. Uh, that's been really good so far. There's a, there are a couple of questions in um, the, the workshop chat. If you wanted to try and maybe work through those, that would, yeah. be, that would be awesome. So there's, there's one from Nyla, and yeah. I guess it's the same one for me, actually. It's, are there any good resources for learning fusion so this is something that i've been meaning to sort of experiment with uh, mm -hmm. more and more because i've seen hard surface people use it more recently um, yeah. and I've, i haven't really got around to it yet so question one is uh resources for learning fusion and i guess leading on from that would be nyla's question which is would you or have you any good objects that you would suggest as like you know good exercises for an artist that are mm -hmm. beginning their hard surface journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, resources for fusion. I looked at, I actually talked to a friend of mine who also got into fusion about the same time as I did, and he basically followed this guy named Duard Mossert. I can, I probably butchered his name, but mm -hmm. I, I can link that tutorial here. That he has really a awesome. really good. Uh, Let's see, I actually have that model here because he shows how to make first this mount, which also might look very complex, but the way he shows how to do it is fantastic. I don't, I don't think you actually need any like intro into fusion per se, if or maybe you do, to be honest. I this is kind of hard for me because I've done it for so long that it just felt natural to me. So I don't know how hard it would be for someone else to just follow that tutorial and do the same. Mm -hmm. But I would I would recommend that tutorial where he makes this mount and then he makes a, a site somewhere. I don't know if I have that here anymore. But uh, that is one I would recommend. I haven't really looked at any other uh like intro into fusion or anything like that yeah. yeah if you could link that tutorial so that it goes through the creation of this is that what you yeah yeah and then uh um a site as well i don't know if i have it as i said uh i might have it in here if it's not hidden it might be in here because it's taking a little while to load no props I think I have it hidden. There, yeah. Ah. So he he teaches you how to make Ooh. this one as well. That fits with that mount, basically. That's very juicy. Yeah. And once again, super simple stuff. It's it's really a cylinder 
a box, a cylinder. Mm-hmm. It's it's basically this. The the word of the day, boxes and cylinders. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so he has those two, and then he also has uh, some courses on art station learning where he goes through how to make a full weapon infusion. Wow. If you're interested in that. Yeah, if you could drop those into the the workshop chat yeah uh, at the end whenever you, you get a chance no 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 panic whenever yeah. you get a minute um yeah the other question that's here um is i guess more workflow orientated and uh, it's for me it's just uh having not, not used fusion before i'm just mm-hmm. wondering how how do you move between this and say i don't know zbrush or blender mm-hmm. or Maya or whatever does this export to fbx or yes right. exactly Okay. So what you do is basically right-click your body, and you can... Let's see if I remember how to do this. Yeah, save as mesh. Okay. And then it'll save as an OBJ or an STL. So it'll have to go into... Like, I would not never use any of these things that come out of Fusion as game models. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would basically throw this into ZBrush... Uh, I can actually show you. Why not? Let's, let's yeah, do this. Yeah, for a simple one would be really good to see just that workflow. Yeah, because essentially what it spits out is this horrible... Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what we'll do is just uh, throw it into here. Then we'll open ZBrush. We'll import it on top of there. And then you have it in here, right? The the thing I usually do with all of my hard surface stuff is to dynamesh it at a quite high that's not dynamesh, that's clear polish. Uh at a quite high resolution. Mm-hmm. And also you will want to export from Fusion at a high resolution because otherwise you get jagged edges and you can't subdivide these meshes at all. I might have crashed three brush, we'll see. Because this slider is not very useful. Oh well, we got 10 million. That's a little little well high. Let's go for like something like that. Yeah, 1 million. That's fine. And essentially when I have dynameshed it, you can see it gets very jagged edges. Mm-hmm. And it's still very, very sharp. Mm-hmm. You don't really want that. So what I usually do is go down to the deformation tab. I uncheck this little thing. And just add a little bit of polish. And it already looks much, much better. Mm-hmm. That's also important to think about when you're doing game assets. You don't want them to sharp because normal maps will be baked pretty bad from that. Yeah, you want you also don't want it too to soft, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah. So when I've done this, I basically either decimate it or leave it as is. Depends on how heavy it is. And then put it into Maya and retop it. So manual retopology. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time. Okay. I despise auto retop mm-hmm. for the most part, unless I'm doing like cloth, yeah, because I can't be bothered. But the the thing is with like auto retop, you most likely will end up with a much higher like rest than you need, mm-hmm. and you can't control the flow as well as you need. There's also something that's very important. Like you, you really want to follow the flow of the actual yep. topology, or so it bakes nicely and looks nice in shading later. Okay, that's actually a good thing as well, uh, point as well. There is another program called Moi 3D, yes. where you can uh, export your fusion meshes into and have that basically auto retop for you a bit. And then clean that up because it produces fairly okay topo, but it's not something I've really delved into that much. Okay, so you generally would just go through manual retopology. Yeah, every time. Okay. I think honestly, it's the best way. It's very tedious, but it's the best way. And mm-hmm. the more you do it, the better you get at it, and the faster you get at it as well. Okay, I think that answers uh, Peter's question. Um... Yeah. Export from Fusion, so game topology. So I think that answers your question, Peter. Yeah. Um, Matt just linked. Oh, that's the tutorial. Uh, yeah, he's need to answer Nyla as well. 
Uh, good objects to learn. Oh, sorry. Yes, I forgot about Nina's question. Yeah, good objects. Good to objects to learn. Yeah, that's always a tough one because it really depends on your interest and your skill level, right? So, like, you can always model a chair from the beginning uh, just to kind of learn the very basics of it and learn what kind of... Uh, what was I going to say? What, like supporting loops and sub-D, right? Because sub-D is extremely good to know, even if you're going to use booleans and stuff like that. Uh, I think starting with weapons, then you should probably go for a knife or something like that in the beginning. Uh, they are usually fairly simple in how they're built, and it also teaches you more of how edge flow is important and how you can work with that a bit more. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a very difficult question because a lot of students start with like fire hydrants or yeah things like that. And sure, they are very good exercises in in hard surface, but they're also a bit overdone, I would say. So. But hey, if you want to do a fire hydrant, go ahead. Absolutely. I think it's good to, to try and do things that you have easy access to for reference. I think that's always yes. a nice point of starting. Like when you're learning these things, having an object right in front of you yeah. can be can be very useful as well. Uh, that's a very good point. Yeah, base it on the real world first mm -hmm. and foremost because you always have measurements and scale and all of that yeah. easily available. That's yeah. a very good point, Paul. Cool. Uh, I think next is Joe. Yeah. Uh, so Joe say asks, um, how would you recommend preparing the models for baking? For example, how do you decide what needs to be baked and what you can get away with through textures? For example. Yeah. Would you, okay. Would you recommend color IDs for things like screws and so on? Uh, so I will be a hypocrite here because I usually make the screws as well because I tend to go a bit overboard in my poly spending. But uh, so the, the the I think the best way to think about it is does it affect the silhouette? If it affects the silhouette enough, and what I mean by that, right, if we have uh, this little cube here and we have a little, let's just make a little indent here. Uh, so let's say we have this little indent, right? This doesn't really affect the silhouette. Like you will never be able to see it from the sides or like see that it actually doesn't exist there. This can be baked in and it would be the same if you have a, let's just duplicate this face and uh, have it here. Even if you had like a little screw here, it still doesn't affect the silhouette. So, technically, you could bake this in, if you want. If you want it to be, like, really high-res and be able to zoom in on the details of the screw, I would probably build it, because you're getting close enough. But, I mean, most screws and, like, weapons and stuff are, like, this size, so it, it doesn't really need the topology. Uh, but let's say it sticks out, right? If it sticks out that much, it does affect the silhouette. And at that point, I would probably build it instead of baking it. But at the same time, that also really depends on your target try count. If you're going for a very, like, let's say, a third person Last of Us style game, the weapons are quite far away from the camera. So at that point, you would never see this anyway, even like if you get fairly close. So at that point, I would probably just modify the mesh and have it further down or try to bake in as much as I can. And yes, if you bake in screws and stuff like that, like or screws are one of those things that are very simple to texture because they are round, so you can just take a soft brush and assign a mask on that, right, in substance. But you could go with an ID map, absolutely. 
the, there's no reason not to, unless you're lazy like me and just click in the mask. <laughs> I think we're getting to a point where, certainly with next gen and stuff like that, it's the poly budgets become a little bit more, um, like there's more scope for yeah. adding in details and so on and so forth. But it, it, I think it, just what you say, it depends in a lot of cases, closeness to camera and use case yeah. is going to make a big difference. But yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, Jackie uh, has asked, uh, can you talk a, a little bit about UVs? Uh, like how do you go about the layout, uh, texture sizes and number, etc.? So I guess if you're maybe breaking things down into multiple texture sets and that sort of thing. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> I'm probably the worst person to ask about this because I tend to go overboard here as well. Um, I, for example, I made a a uh, rifle, an M4. I can probably bring that up so it's easier for you to follow with here. Go into my own art station. I wouldn't recommend that you actually do what I do, but this one is split up into, I think, four texture sets or something like that. I think I did. And it's also around 50,000 tries. Like this is uh, what you would have in something like Call of Duty maybe. And there's really no reason for me to split this up in that many uh, because it would never really be used that way unless it's like a viewport model or something like that. So the way I would look at it is, if you're gonna go for a, a game perspective or a, like a game dev perspective, it's looking at what of these pieces are interchangeable, um, or is it gonna be customizable, right? Can you take the buttstock off? Can you take the grip off and change it to something else? Then you can have those on separate ones and go via that workflow if you want. Um, but generally, this could fit on one texture map. Like it, it doesn't need that many. It's just so I could get like as much resolution out of it as possible. Uh, but the layout is that's that's a very difficult one to answer because it depends each time you do something. Uh, like generally, you want to pack it as as tightly as possible, right? And if you want to get in to be a weapon artist, you should probably look at mirroring UVs as well, because you most likely will only see one side of a weapon like this. So the other side could be exactly the same as this side. Nobody will ever know. I didn't do it on this one, and I usually don't do it because I'm lazy, once again. So don't, don't do as I do, just... Yeah. Uh, I it's think a, I hope that answers it. I think that question comes up a lot with with students yeah. about like texture resolution and and texture set Oh yeah, size texture and, resolution. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say for portfolio, you you can go a little higher than you usually should because it also is eye candy, but you need to show that you understand what would be reasonable. Like this model in a third person game would most likely be at 1k or maybe 512 it, it wouldn't be higher than that because let's say like you have a 1440p screen that's a 2k screen so covering your whole screen in that case would be 2k right so if you like don't quote me on that by the way but i think that's kind of how it works but i would say try it out go for a 2k does it still look good okay try it in 1k does it still look good well then you can probably try 512 again and see if that looks good if it doesn't you can always uppress it or split it into more and remember that one 4k is the cost of four 2ks so even having two 2ks would be cheaper in a texture size standpoint. Yes, you'll have two shaders. It'll be more expensive that way, but yeah, I, I think that's how I would go with about it. Like I, I 
use way too high textures because I, I think it's nice to have very crisp stuff, but you shouldn't really do that as a student, I think. I think for portfolios, I think what you said at the outset is kind of the key. Like if you're doing something where you, you really want to show off surface definition and yeah. you know make things pop out, then I think it's it's okay. As long as you understand, I guess, the optimization that you know is required to make that a game ready piece is kind of like a yeah. key element but yeah yeah it's something yeah. that comes up a lot i think a lot of students ask that question about texture resolutions and texture sizes and stuff like that yeah there is no just one answer no, there's exactly yeah. so many answers to it it depends it depends it's, yeah it yeah depends on a lot of things um cool uh shane asks um <laughs> so shane is looking to specialize uh in weapon modeling mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and just looking for any kind of advice that you might have about sort of like what sort of skills or, or things should be focused on um, if that's the kind of the area that you want to specialize in. Okay, so if you want to specialize in uh, in weapon modeling, like my journey was very weird, I would say. Uh, like environments I did for a very short time during my school time because we had a specialization course, just as you guys probably do. And uh, I tried doing an environment, but I really, it wasn't really for me. So what I also found out when doing the environment was that props is fun. And I've always liked weapons for just the aesthetic of them and their shapes and the materials. Uh, so I kind of talked over myself there. I don't really remember where I was going to go with that. But so essentially, if if you want to go into weapons, I would uh, focus on sub D first, so you learn how that workflow works, because that will also teach you the flow of the topology, which is important in the uh, low poly as well. Um, and then you can also, of course, throw in booleans in there. Throw in fusion if you want as well. But I, I would say start with sub D. Look at how that works so you understand the, the theory of the modeling workflow from the beginning. Because all of it kind of meshes together at the end. You will use all of them together, essentially. Okay. Um, and then... It's, I would say reach out to professional weapon artists and ask them for advice if you need. Don't be scared to reach out at all to industry professionals. They most likely will answer as long as you treat them with respect as you would anybody else and respect their time, of course, and try to listen to what they're telling you because there there's a reason why they are where they are now, right? But then there's also... Some good, I think there's, I don't know if it was a Zebra Summit talk or a GDC talk, but there's one that's quite old from the division where the weapons team there talked about how they used the Zebra Boolean workflow for Division 1. And uh, I would recommend you watch that. And then there's also a AD level article from Alex Medina, who is a hard surface artist at Crytek, how he makes weapons for Hunt, which if, is the same workflow as well. If if you could, again, at the yeah. end, just uh, drop yeah. those into the, the workshop chat, that would be that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, get a lot of different uh, feedback? Resources and Reasons. feedbacks, yeah. yeah. Talk to a lot of people, see what they do. Because everybody does it differently, and maybe one of them works well for you, or another one works well for you. Like it's, yeah, yeah. I think the critique thing is is super important for not only weapons, I guess, for everything. It's just talking to people who are doing this every day, and maybe you know listening to their commentary and the suggestions mm. that they make. Um, mm. I know there's a is it war war dog. Wardog? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wardog, yeah. Wardog. Um, there's a bunch of really good uh, weapon people at Wardog, Shane. Um, I'll link you that in yep. class on Friday. But yeah, 
definitely talking to people and sort of following people is 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 key i think um really really important as well yeah um but yeah i think that's that's pretty much us coming up to the end of yeah. our session oh hold on one final question thomas if you have one time. final question uh did Thank you, you ever use a mid poly workflow um we'll make that the last question for yeah for vehicles i i tend to use it sometimes um but for weapons mostly not mm -hmm. because it is i don't know i i have a hard time using mid poly for myself i i prefer doing bake stuff because yeah i don't know it, it's it's just a preference yeah i also linked a really good uh little pdf here with introduction to modeling game uh, weapons for oh, first awesome. person games awesome where it goes through every single step and framing uvs textures all of that and the, the workflow and thoughts about it is that the last link that you just posted yes pin, yes pin that message to this channel oh yeah there. i need to find the gdc talk as well it's super super useful okay well thank you very much that was super informative um it's given us a lot of insight into sort of your workflow and indeed the hard surface workflow for for asset creation prop creation uh, i really appreciate you taking the time um out of your hectic schedule to sort of spend time with us this evening and i'm sure people find that very very useful so just thank you again for for doing it thomas really appreciate it yeah you're very welcome it was a pleasure and i hope i didn't or I didn't confuse anyone or no. anything like that. That was awesome. And uh, yeah, if anybody of you wants to reach out and ask questions to me or anything, just do so. I'm I'm happy to help if I can. That's amazing. Either through ArtStation or Twitter or Discord or LinkedIn or whatever. Yeah, if you want to drop your Twitter in the in the chat as well, I've dropped your ArtStation in there already. But if you want to drop your Twitter, you can you can do that as well. I will do so absolutely. Cool. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording there.